the first Sunday of 2021. I can't wait to see what happens in here today as soon as we find some people to come in and join us. Very encouraging. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to Cornerstone. It's a brand new year. We can finally put 2020 behind us. Why don't we start yeah. this year off right and let's worship God this morning. Come on, let's stand up and go.
Everybody learned from 2020 that God is in control. Are you going into the new year believing that? All right. My person on the front row. Anybody in the back anywhere? Come on, let's declare this.
Walking down this desert road, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound. Holy water on 
shaking the earth, shaking things up, things getting torn down that need to be torn down. And then this song is talking about more or less washing, washing away, washing in that forgiveness. You know what it kind of sounds like? A renovation job. You know, yesterday, Mike and I went down to his parents and we tore up carpet. You know, and on the surface, it looked like a pretty clean room. But then when you got in there and you started cutting carpet, shaking stuff around, it left a big mess because all the dirt that was soaked up in that carpet was exposed and it made a huge mess. And guess what you got to do? You got to sweep away that dirt. You got to get rid of that dirt. And then you got to wash it out to make room for the renovation. And that's what's going on right now. Last year was about tearing up the carpet, shaking out the dirt, making that dirt exposed. So this year in 21 is going to be the biggest renovation job that you're going to see. All right, say this about 2021. Declare this. Say, no soup for you. That's right. Deep cries out. Come on, baby.
have VBS this year, please. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Family Church. For those of you that are here, it is so good to see your faces in person. Thank you for being here today. And for those of you watching at home on the sofa, we're glad that you tuned in. Perhaps you're watching this morning and you've been thinking about coming. Maybe you've never set foot in here or maybe it's been a while. Well, let me tell you, get up. Put on the most comfortable blue jeans you've got and the most comfortable sweatshirt because I want you to be comfortable or comfortable, as Hannah would say when she was little. And then you come in and you park. Then you walk in the door and you walk in the lobby. Normally, you would be greeted by greeters, but until that happens, all you do is you walk down the long hallway and you come in the sanctuary. You find a place to sit and you let go and you let God. And for those of you maybe that haven't been in a while and maybe you're battling and you're fighting insecurities or junk in your mind about what will people think if I come back now, let me tell you, we've already thought what we're going to think about you. It's okay. But let me tell you what we're going to think. We're going to think, man, it is so good to see you. And even though we're not supposed to hug, guess what? I'm going to hug you. I'm going to hug you because it will be so good to see you walk through those doors again. Do not let anything keep you. If God has drawn you back, come on. Come on home. You're home. All you got to do is walk through the door. Come on home. All right. I want Angelina and Clinton to stand up. Come on. All right, nursery workers, I told you. These people did not social distance. They are contributing to the baby boom of 2021. Woo, we're going to have a baby. Royal Rotten Repass arriving 2021. Yeah, I've been waiting a long time to say that. Oh, I want to encourage some of you that are note takers, and maybe you've never taken notes. But I want to encourage you to get a journal or just a cheap notebook from the dollar store. And as Pastor Scott is talking to us on Sunday mornings, I just want to encourage you to take notes, to write down something that maybe clicks with you or sticks with you or maybe it'll trigger something else. And I want you just to start 
writing what God is speaking to you during the service. And I promise you that a few months, if you go back and you look at some of your past notes, you'll be amazed at the work that God has done in you. It'll remind you of a season that you were in and how far you've come. So I want to encourage those of you that have never done that before to let this be a year where you take some notes and go back and ponder and go back and look at what God has spoken to your hearts here on Sunday morning. There will be youth Wednesday night at the Teen Center. If you are going to win a retreat, Wednesday night will be the last night to turn in your deposit and your forms. And the forms are on the table in the lobby, so make sure and pick those up if you have not signed up. And I'm pretty sure that most of our youth are going to win a retreat because it is one of the highlights of the year, and you don't want to miss it. So please, please, please make sure and get your name on that list so that you will be part of Winter Retreat Remix 2021. KOZ is back in session this Saturday for boys and girls, KOZ and KOZ Pink, KOZ Kids Outdoor Zone, where we take the kids, the guys go one way, the girls go another, and they are outside, and they are doing good stuff and God stuff and guy stuff and girl stuff, and it is good because they are outside they are out of the house they are off their technology they are away from their eye this or eye that and it's good so parents if you have children 8 to 18 have them here Saturday 9 o'clock drop them off we never know what their adventure is going to be so you dress according to what the weather is if it's going to snow you might want to wear your snow boots and four or five coats whatever um We feed them lunch, and we'll have them back to you about 2 o'clock. So I encourage you, and if you have kids in your family, maybe they don't go to church or grandkids or nieces or nephews or whatever, neighbors, use this as a time to invite them, to bring them, to get them on campus and let them be a part of something. So this Saturday, 9 o'clock, and leaders, the guys meet on this side after church and the ladies in the Family Growth Center. And if you're interested in helping, we can always use more hands on deck because you don't have to come up with a lesson. Maybe all you have to do is crowd control to make sure we don't lose anybody. But we could use some extra hands with both the men and the ladies. So if you're interested in that, guys after church, just meet with the guys. And ladies, just meet over here with Jill, and she'll tell you what your plans are for next Saturday. Oh, my goodness, this morning as we get ready to give can tell you two things that your money's going to go for. One of it it's already went for. Some of your money went to Walmart yesterday and bought a new vacuum cleaner. I'm just going to tell you. Because when we were in here cleaning up from the Christmas trees, I got tired of emptying that thing out. It was barely picking up. I think we had literally worn it out. And you know, we don't think about that, just the tangible things that it takes to make ministry happen. You know, just the the behind the scenes things, the cleaning supplies and the vacuum cleaners and ladders and and things like that. And something else your money is going to go for this year is going to be a new Christmas tree because when we took it down, uh, there wasn't much left. But isn't it pretty when we come in 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 Christmas time and everything's decorated and it looks so good and it's so pretty and you guys take pictures in front of all the trees and stuff? Well, guess what? It costs money for stuff like that too. And just to let you know that your money goes for tangible things like that as well as supporting the other things that your money goes to. So thank you for your faithful, faithful, faithful giving in the year of 2020. And I expect 2021 to be even bigger and better. So thank you for that. Father, I thank you for the people that have hearts to give. And God, they don't store it up and they don't make sure that they're taken care of first and then tip you on the back end. But God, they put you first. And God, they get it. They know that you are our provision, that you provide. And God, when we tithe and we give offerings, we are saying that we trust you, that we know that you will take care of us. And we honor you, God, with our giving. It's a form of worship, and it's a way that we honor you, God, with checks and with money and with tithely. We honor you, God. Thank you for the privilege of being able to do so. In your name we pray. Amen. Just bring your checks and money and drop it in the bucket. And if you're using Tithely, you can go to Tithely.com or go to the CFC Princeton page. And there's a link on there that will take you straight to Tithely. And children, third through sixth grade, gather at the back door for Kids Church.
Good morning. It is 2021. Amen. Let's give it a hand clap that it did make it here and that we're here and we're here together. And I thank the Lord for that. Um, I, I wanted to just say this morning, you know, I've been praying about what God would lay on my heart to encourage people because I think that's what 2021 needs to be. We need to be a year of encouraging. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is about a choice. You know, sometimes we just really have to make our minds up. We live our lives, and, and a lot of times we, we don't realize the roller coasters that we're on. And, and we're on, and we're up, and we're down, and we're up, and we're down. And that's not what God's will for our life is. God's will for our life is that we stay even keel. But a lot of times that's because of our choices. So this morning I picked a song that, that chooses that he's my healer, that chooses that he's more than enough for me, and that it chooses that nothing is impossible for him. Go ahead.
Thanks, Kim. Hope that's a personal cry from most of y'all's hearts and what God's done in you in 2020. Uh, well, 2021, the first Sunday of the year, and this is the Sunday that all the pastors get up and they, they unfurl the great banner of, here's our catchphrase. I couldn't think of anything good that rhymed with 2021. It's like, 2021, the year we have fun. It's like, <laughs> nothing I came up with seemed very spiritual. And I just decided, you know what, that kind of stuff is for young pastors and young churches, and I'm way too old for that. And spiritually speaking, I hope that we're old enough where we're not relying on catchphrases and sound bites, but you're ready to, to tear into the meat of God's Word in 2021. That doesn't mean that we're going to show you new passages of Scripture that you've never seen before. We're going to show you old passages of Scripture, and we're going to read them, things you've heard, things you've read, and you're going to see things you've never seen before. And that's what we've been doing even through Christmas. We've been showing you through the Christmas story things you've read dozens and dozens and dozens of times, but things you never saw before. And it was a prelude to what God is going to do in this year. I don't know. I've been, been talking to God a lot this weekend. I, I don't know to what degree God looks at our calendars and our clocks and all that stuff. He says, okay, it's the end of the year. It's the start of a new year, so I've got to do something incredible now. That may be us more than God, but one thing for sure when we look at the Bible, we see that God, from the very beginning, he is the one that marked out the calendars and, and, and the timelines and the clocks with, with how many days were in a year and how many days were in a week and how many hours were in a day. So to some degree, God is watching man through that filter, and he's monitoring what's going on with us. Now, if you've been here for a long time, then you have to hear me repeat stories time and time again because that's what people do. We only have so many stories. Um, but my dad, I, uh, I'd love to have him back telling those same stories that I got tired of hearing because I realized that now as I'm older, I would hear his stories in a different way and they would become more personal. So if when I tell you a story of my life, and you go, oh, I've heard that one before. Listen closely because you may hear something about yourself in that story. Um, I've shared with you a couple times before when I was 16 years old, I think somewhere around then, I was back in the edge of the field and we were clearing new ground. How many of you country folks know what I'm talking about, clearing new ground? You bunch of city slickers, oh my gosh. Well, we were clearing brush and uh, we were trying to create more pasture land for the cattle and we grew up with tools and I mean, we were driving tractors by the time we were eight, nine years old, you know, and, and we were, my dad, I mean, you couldn't trust a kid with power tools. I have proven you cannot trust your child with power tools. And uh, after the leaf blower experience, then she wants to use the skill saw or something like that's going to happen. But we just grew up with things like chainsaws and so forth. And I was probably 16 years old and my dad, he he gave me my assignment and what I was supposed to be doing, and it was going to be one of those nights I was looking forward to because we were going to have a huge bonfire. If you grew up in the country, which I'm getting it slowly that most of you all did not, uh, we would clear off brush and we would make just these gigantic uh, brush piles, and then we would get to burn them. And it was always on a Friday night when there was school, no, no school the next day, and we would get to stay out there till 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning and watch the brush fire and make sure that it didn't catch anything else on fire. And uh, my older brother and I really loved that. Robbie was a little too young to get in on that with us at that point, but we loved that so much. So I was, I was up on top of this brush pile, and it wasn't really laying down the way that I should. And my dad, time and time again, would say the same things to me that I say to my daughter every time she gets in the car. If I have her come up and tell you what is the last thing your dad says every time you go to get in the car, not the Hummer, but the car for some reason I'm more concerned about, 
um, the way it's angled into the garage, she will tell you, the last thing I say is, now, baby, when you back out, please be careful at the side of the garage there, because if you're not watching, you will take out the car, the garage door, and the side of the house right there, and we will have to call three different repairmen to come out here. And she, every time I tell her, her eyes instantly roll back in her head, and I can hear from her soul, would you stop telling me this every stinking time I get in this car? Baby, am I, am I telling the truth here? Yes. My dad, time and time again, son, be careful with that chainsaw. Keep your eyes on that chainsaw. Stay focused when you've got that chainsaw. It's like, yes, dad, yes, I know how to use a chainsaw. I'm 16. Have you not figured it out? I know everything. I'm 16, for goodness sake. What is, what is left to learn about life? So I'm up on top of this chainsaw. On top, yeah, I'm on top of the chainsaw because I know what I'm doing with the chainsaw. I'm on top of the brush pile, and it's a little rickety, and I'm rocking, and it's not very stable, and I'm using the chainsaw. And my dad was not standing there at the time, or he'd have had a cow. My older brother was standing, and he said, that doesn't look safe. And I said, I know what I'm doing. And so it's, it's rickety, and I'm rocking back and forth. And and I'm sawing on this piece of wood, and all of a sudden, I, I lose my footing, and I start to fall, and I pull back like this, and I'm so, I know, I know so much about everything at 16 that I know, don't take your finger off of the trigger. Keep the trigger down, man, and keep that thing going. I reel back, and I lose my balance this way, and I come back down with that chainsaw, and hit my leg right below my kneecap. And so I react, and I pull back again, chainsaw going full blast, and I lose my balance again, and I come back again, and a half inch below the first place I hit my leg, I hit again, and blood was squirting out everywhere, and, and at that point, I just threw the chainsaw, and I got down off the brush pile. I had blue jeans on. There were big rips in them. I didn't know that if I would have saved those, they would have come in style at some point. <laughs> and I looked through those holes in my jeans, and the sight that I saw would make milk curdle. I mean, it's like you could see to the bone in there, and it just two places. And so my brother, he put me in the bucket of the tractor and drove me home because I couldn't walk. And, of course, my mom comes out and and if you've ever been a mom, you know everything is about you as soon as something happens to your child. Oh, my gosh, how could I let this happen? I know I'm not much of a mother. I've just been a terrible mother. It's like I'm bleeding to death over here. My sister um, was a nurse in her younger years, and so my mom always called my, my sister, and she would come and doctor on us. It was not the days where we went to the emergency room unless the limb was actually missing. <laughs> I mean, it had to be a full amputation before you ever even considered going to the emergency room in those days. And my sister came up, and she squeezed everything together, and she created what we would now call butterfly bandages, but then we called it duct tape. And, <laughs> and she taped everything back together, and, and it was well worth it because my mom said, I've got some Coke in here. Would that make you feel better? We were country folks. We drank nothing but milk with a half an inch of cream floating on top um, from milking the cows. Never could get all the milk skimmed off. And it's like, yes, a Coke, it'll be all worth it if I can just have a Coke. It was a different time. My point is, is that every time my dad said, be careful after that, I heard it in a different way. Because I learned that there was a reason why he kept saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. There's many things that I have preached to you through the years and other people have preached to you that landed, didn't land. The things that really didn't land deep in your soul, it's because you had not had an experience in life yet to run that through as a filter. And so you're going to hear me talk about many things in 2021 that you've heard me talk about many times, topically speaking. But because of what we've went through in 2020, I have to believe you're going to hear it just a little bit differently. It's going to land differently. What I'm going to talk about today is nothing new. But I hope you're going to see some things you've never noticed in this story before 
And I hope that it lands prophetically in your soul differently. It's for those of you here today. It's those, for those of you at home today. We're all one church. We're one family. We're together in heart today. In spirit, we're all together as a church family. And though we're still in very uncertain times, these uncertain times as far as the pandemic um, goes is not going to last forever. And then we have to look at our life and how will we re-enter life. So I read you a story last week, and I said there's four phases to life. There's the birth, being born, or born again, spiritually speaking. There's the growing up, the spiritual maturity. There's the activation in life with gifts and callings and anointing. And then there's the death where we hopefully leave a legacy. And I opened the door to the spiritual growth part, and I'm going to go back to that exact same story, the story that, that, that is housed within the framework of what we talked about last week with spiritual growth. And I'm going to read this story again. I'm going to point something out to you that the human intellect will battle and that the, the intelligent, contemporary American mind thinks that they have now been elevated and superseded in their thoughts beyond. But I'm going to bring you back to a place of Jesus' prophecy and imagery that will hopefully pull you back to one of the most foundational things that God would ever need you to understand about your life. It's the story of when Jesus was 12 years old, and they went to Jerusalem. They went to celebrate and party, and they headed back home. It was a spiritual celebration, by the way. They went to the feast, and on their way home from Passover, um, they realize a day later that their little boy Jesus is not with them. They thought he was with a family member, and he wasn't with any of them, and they go back to Jerusalem to find him. So we pick the story up every year. His parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. And the feast was over. And while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple courts, in the temple courts, in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be, I had to be, I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. And my question to you today, do you understand what he was saying to them? Now, how many of you guys remember your little babies? And some of you still have little babies and, and are about to have some little babies. And, and maybe your little babies have grown up and have babies of their own now. But how many of you guys remember anxiously awaiting the first words they would ever speak? And how many of you mommies and daddies were secretly pulling that baby aside, programming them, everything in you trying to get daddy to be the first thing they would say, dad, dad, anything that sounded like that. And then mommy's doing the same thing, mommy, mommy, mama, mommy, and just, it's got to be the first words, and it becomes a competition. I'll never forget Hannah's first words as she looked into my eyes and said, Father. <laughs> Now, I clearly remember her first words. They were, <laughs> I don't even remember anymore what the first thing out of her mouth was, but I remember when the first thing came out that made any sense at all, just how excited that I was because she officially began to talk. A lot of people don't realize that these words of Jesus that we just read were his first words recorded in the Word of God. We move into 
the Gospels deeper when he launches his ministry from 30 years old and, and we begin to read everything he says and we hang on every word that he says and we sometimes never think about that. Is there a chance that the first words that Jesus speaks that is re remembered and recorded, part of the inspired word of God, was part of divine plan of God. Sure, he had been speaking before then. From a toddler to 12, he had been speaking. From 12 to 30, he had been speaking. Why is it in a 30-year period we get one statement from Jesus? It's remembered, it's divinely inspired and recorded as part of the Word of God. Is it just a history lesson? Is it just something, okay, so we get one little story of something that happened in Jesus' life as a little boy. Isn't that cute? Isn't that wonderful? Well, we can use this on Mother's Day probably. It's so cute. Or could it be one of the single most prophetic passages in the Bible? You see, all the other things that Jesus said all happened within a three-year span, and he said a lot. In fact, the writers of the Gospels have, have, had already declared that Books could not contain everything that he said and that he did. There's a 30-year span, and one statement is captured and given to humanity. Why were you looking for me? Did you not understand that I have to be in my Father's house? Now, the thing is, is that we can begin to tear that apart now, and we can say, well, how much of that was natural, and how much of that was spiritual? How much of that really was just about Jewish custom and Jewish days? How much of that had anything to do with us today in a, in a, in a grace covenant, a, a new covenant to the church? And that's one of the big things that theologians wrestle with. When it comes to the person of Jesus, when Jesus is doing something that would just go along with Jewish custom and Jewish tradition, and Jesus was doing it also, to what degree are we supposed to look at that and go, okay, he was just going along with the crowd because that's where he lived? And to what degree are we supposed to look at that and say, God is trying to tell us something in that? Well, there's a way to figure it out, by the way. Theologians look at it and they go, okay, we see the system of God. When it's a dead tradition, when it's something that doesn't seem to matter, Jesus goes against the grain, and it makes the teachers of the law furious. And it's God's way of saying, it's a dead tradition. It has nothing to do with me. But when Jesus cooperates with it, when it appears to be just a Jewish tradition, then we understand that when Jesus is doing it, because he is the pattern, he is the first fruits of who we are then we are to understand that God is saying, this is significant, and you need to pay attention. So in his first 30 years, God says, I'm going to give you one thing, one thing in the first 30 years. I'm going to say to you, why were you looking for me in other places? Did you not understand that I have to be in my Father's house? And now we have to understand what Jesus meant when he said Father's house. Because that can go in many different directions. And so theologians say, well, one thing for sure, if we're going to be pretty safe in ascertaining the, the mind of God, we have to use Scripture to translate scripture, to understand scripture. We've got to go to other scripture. And so we look in context of what is literally going on. And he's in the temple courts. He's hanging out with the teachers there. He is talking to them. He is asking them questions. It sounds like they are asking him questions back. And it's quite an amazing time. They have found him in the temple courts. That place that we in our culture, though we will help you understand this a little differently in a few minutes. The place that we today would call church, that is where he literally was. And the context is when he said, did you not know I had to be in my father's house? He was talking about the very environment of where he was there with the teachers discussing the word of God. 
we understand that the Father's house spiritually can mean many different things. But what was Jesus talking about? He seemed to literally be talking about a location, a place where they found him. And he was saying, did you not know that in this kind of environment is where I have to be? I I love the the, the urgency that he's speaking with that. He, He wasn't just offering it, here's an idea, here's a concept, here's an option. The Son of God who represents God and represents humanity as God is trying to make us, said, do you not understand? I have to be here. Why are you looking in other places? This is where you're going to find me. There's been a lot of arguments through the years, and I will just, I will just tell you, based on Everybody's part, including this guy here, we operate in so much ignorance. And we will run the Word of God through, through the filters of our culture and, and our generation. And we will miss the heart of God so often. And oh my goodness, the wrestling matches we have had with that term church. The big battle cry, of course, in our generation, this slice of our generation is is we don't have to go to church. We are the church. Let me just clarify something to you. Church is from the Greek word ecclesia. It means the called out ones. The gathering are the, gathering the fellowship of God's children. And I want you to know we are the church. The Bible never calls what we're doing here today the church. So people are right when they say we don't need to go to church. We are the church. Where people miss it, with ignorance is, yeah, the Bible doesn't say you have to go to church because the Bible never calls it the church. The Bible calls it the fellowship or the gathering. And mostly it was called the fellowship. We call it going to church. They didn't call it going to church. They understood we are the church. They also understood the church must be part of the gathering. The gathering. The gathering. This would be a very prophetic picture we see with Jesus in the temple courts. The synagogues that would be what we would call the church back then. The buildings that we now call the church because culturally speaking, it just evolved that way. And so we will continue doing that because we understand what we're saying. But understand the deeper things that When we say, hey, that's the church down there. Where do you go to church? Oh, I go to Cornerstone Family Church. We get it. We understand that building is not the church. That gathering is not the church. But that is the place where the church gathers. And that specifically is what Jesus was talking about. The place where God and his people would gather together as a family. Now, when the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts, Jesus has risen from the dead. He has uh, done a Chris angel and he's rising into the air. He's disappearing before them, trying to make it abundantly, abundantly clear. I am physically not going to be with you anymore. I'm going to make this as obvious as I can. It had nothing to do with Jesus going to live in the sky. That's the old Jewish concept. God lives out there in the sky somewhere. Some of you may still have old old Jewish concepts of God. God lives in a spirit realm. Not a heavenly realm as far as where the, the stars and the moons and the planets are at. That's a heavenly realm in the natural. That's not God's realm. God's realm is a spiritual realm that you can't see with natural eyes. He was rising into the sky where everybody could have a bird's eye view of him, literally, so they would understand, I physically am leaving you. You have to take the ball into your court now. Take the torch and run with it. Everything I've trained you to do, you can't call me anymore, not physically speaking. I'm not going to physically be there to do this for you anymore. I am now leaving. 
though we understand. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So it wasn't long after he disappeared into the sky, physically leaving them, that he returned. Because the Father, the Son, and the Spirit cannot be separated. It amazes me how, the, how polytheistic the 20th century church became. Three gods. There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Ghost. There's three of them. They've got three big chairs all sitting beside each other because we pulled from one little scripture, pulled it out of context. I want you to know you cannot separate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you've seen the Father, you've seen the Son. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. It's all wrapped up within the Spirit of God. It's like an egg. They're separate, but they're the same. You saying you don't believe in the Trinity? No, I absolutely believe in the Trinity. I just don't believe in three separate gods like they began to teach in the 20th century American church. I don't know how God separated himself and was wherever he was at in, in heavenly realms and yet on the earth in a, in, a, in a man's body at the same time. He's God. He's quite amazing with things like that. But I know that the Holy Spirit came and he, he filled people and he began to do something that had never happened in human history corporately. He began to dwell inside of people. And we became the very temple of God. The house of God. Yet something different than what Jesus seemed to be talking about in that story in Luke. So people are saved. They're, they're hearing the message. They're believing upon Jesus Christ for salvation. And they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. They, in fact, spiritually speaking, become the house of God. And yet we see, historically speaking, nobody was going around saying, oh, now we are the house of God, so we don't have to go to the house of God anymore. In fact, what we see is this thing that they called the gathering was launched. Look at this familiar passage in, in, Luke, uh, in Acts chapter 2. This is the story of the gathering and what was taking place in the gathering. They, those that were born again, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Not to fellowship. The, do you see the word the there? Now, we're together and we're fellowshipping together, okay? That's not the context here. They were fellowshipping together, but that's not what this song. The fellowship. You ever notice that word in there before? They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Well, what's going on in the fellowship? Well, the breaking of bread and prayer. Is that all I gave you? Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. I think you're supposed to keep going to 47, if you can do that. If not, we're going to stop. And the believers were together. The believers were where? They were together and had everything in common. All right, let's move on because that's getting distracting. Oh, there it is. And selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as he had need. I'm not even going to turn around anymore. So listen. We're so smart. We're so advanced. We're so intellectual. There's a reason why Paul talks about that the human intellect is at enmity with God. Because the carnal nature is repulsed by the things that God says, this is what I want you to do. We don't know why we feel that way. There's something about our carnal nature. We, we struggle to agree with God just like children struggle to agree with their parents. And we see this historic picture in Acts that now this thing has come into a, a pattern that's bigger than just one man now. And we see that the people are gathering into what they call the fellowship. They didn't have churches. They couldn't go to the synagogues. The synagogues were for Jews. There was no temple court they could go hang out in. Uh, but So that where are they gathering? I don't know. 
if we read on, you'll see they were gathering in homes. They were gathering in houses. But you'll see they were still, it's interesting, they were still sneaking into the temple courts. And they were hanging out. The apostles were teaching them. It was just like our church services. They, they, there was worship. They were breaking bread. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole communion thing. It was a different world then than what it is right now. We do a, a, a play off of that. And it's, it's a beautiful, powerful thing, much different than what was going on there, though. Um, they're together. They're being taught about the Holy Spirit, about the kingdom of God, about the work of the cross, about the plan of God, the purpose of God. They're praying because they're together. As you keep reading into, into Acts for a couple of chapters there, you see that because of what was going on in the fellowship, signs and wonders, there were miracles flowing, and there was mass evangelism taking place. Mass evangelism. There was an anointing. There was an authority. There was something happening when two or more would gather together in his name. There were powerful things beginning to happen, and it was happening in the fellowship. The fellowship, the gathering of the believers. I don't know what happened later on, uh, probably a generation into this thing. And the writer of, of Hebrews, which was most likely Paul, it would seem that he was already having to contest with people who thought they were too smart for that. They, they had got the concept that, okay, the work of the cross, we understand, Son of God, He came, He died, He rose again, um, the Holy Spirit came, fill Him, we've got that, we're flowing in gifts. Uh, they seemed like, they felt like they had a handle on it, and they didn't need the fellowship anymore. They didn't need to be part of the fellowship. And that's why when Paul addresses it here, or whoever is the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider how we may spur, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now stop that just for a second. Let us consider... Y'all ever consider? When y'all consider you do this, let us consider. That's how you're supposed to do it. Let us consider. And if you tap your chin, you are really considering now. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. How can we do this? Well, let's go to the next verse and find out. Well, let us not give up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Would you say that we're deeper into the, the day, speaking of the day of the Lord, are we deeper into it now than when this was written, would you say? This was 2,000 years ago. This is at the starting gate of everything God is doing in the earth. The day of the Lord has been going on for, for 2,000 years. It's the day of God. It's the grace covenant. It's the day of God finally fulfilling his plan in the earth and humanity. This is the very beginning. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, if you stop gathering, this isn't going to work for you. He continues on talking about those who are shrinking back. They're shrinking back. Away from what? The concept seemed to be they were shrinking back away from God. They were shrinking away from everything God was doing because they thought the plan of God was just that they understood uh, the work of the cross. They understood I'm filled with the Spirit and, and, and God's got me. He saved me. He's going to bless my socks off. He's going to provide for me. They thought the plan was fulfilled in knowing that. So they said, well, we don't need the fellowship anymore. We already know what the preacher is going to preach. We're tired of singing those same songs over and over again. We already know what's going to happen. We come in, we sit there, it's time for a live stream to start. Everyone's just sitting there staring at each other, and then boom, all of a sudden it begins, man. And we get loud, and for, for, we do two fast songs, and then we do a slow song, then we do another fast song. And if it's not the pandemic, then we say, well, y'all just step out and love on each other for a while. I can hear Pastor Scott saying it because he said it for 25 years. And we step out and we love on each other and we greet, and greet each other. And the praise team's up there just being loud and obnoxious, man, and just cranking on those instruments. And, man, it's, and then, and then um, sometimes it would go to video commercials, and that was how we would know now it's time to take our seats. And then after that, Miss Susie would come up and she gives announcements and she takes up the offering. And then sometimes we have a special song, sometimes we don't. And then Pastor Scott comes and preaches and then we go home. We've been there, we've done that, we know how it works. 
it seemed like there were some people there who thought they understood more than what God did in that first century church. The letter of Hebrews was written to Jewish people, um, Messianic Jews, who had gotten the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so surprising um, because on one hand, because they had so much to learn that they just they did not understand. But on the other hand, it also shows us how people who are religious by nature because of how they've grown up can suddenly just lock things in little boxes and say, I know how this is supposed to work. I need this, but I don't need that. The writer of Hebrews is imploring them, please don't stop gathering together like some have because they're shrinking back. They're shrinking away. And when we look at the, the story in Acts and we put it together with church history, even all the way up to modern times where, where people now really know how to study uh, the life of the church and what goes on in the church gatherings and how it affects people that are there versus people that aren't there, it's interesting uh, because it, it, it's very obvious. But I quickly wrote down the things that, that everyone agrees is a purpose, a primary purpose in coming together. And one of those things, of course, is, is the corporate worship experience. I don't know if anyone's ever told you this. I've been mean to for the last 25 years. Worship isn't about you. It's about Him. It's not about if you're in the mood or not in the mood. It's not about if is that your favorite song or is it not the, your favorite song. It's about us coming together as a church family, the believers, the fellowship, the, 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 the kings in the earth, coming together, collecting together in one place with one voice and saying, let me tell you about God. We see a very prophetic picture in Isaiah 6 as the angels, uh, which translated means messengers of God. So therefore, it can be a very powerful prophetic symbol of you and I. And they're flying to and fro. Why? Because they're in heavenly realms, like where we're seated. And all they're doing is they're going back and forth around the throne of God. And they're going, he's holy. He's holy. He's holy. And they're going to each other. It's like, did you know he's holy? Yeah, we knew he was holy. I, I didn't know if you knew he was holy. Oh, yeah, he's holy. He's set apart. There's nobody like him. There's nobody like God. What is the corporate worship experience about? It's about talking about how great he is, how awesome he is. It's about bragging on God. It's about, it's about declaring things into the earth and declaring things into the heavenly realms because there are entities that live in both. And we're saying, let us tell you about God. And we play on our instruments and we make sounds that, that I think about with the human mind. Aaron, I, I, I think we take so for granted the things that we can do on instruments with our fingers. How, how did our brain ever come to the point of developing these instruments that make very specific sounds? We put them together as chords, play in specific keys together most of the time, and, and, and we learn to sing. We take our voice that just as a talking voice, and all of a sudden we start doing something else, and now we're singing songs. It's different than talking, and all this stuff just evolves over time, and it's all for one purpose, to gather together and glorify the king of kings. It's very important. It's very important when you come in that you don't make it about you. Well, I'm not in the mood. Well, that's just not my thing. Really? Glorifying God's not your thing? I understand. You may not have a good voice. It can't be worse than my wife's voice. I promise you. Cats scream, children run and cry. But she sure looks good at conferences in those high heels. I'm making fun of my wife because this is the things that she always tells people. And she's not near as bad singing or cooking as she makes it out to be. There's no excuse. We come together to corporately worship. We come together to be corporately taught. That's what they did. They sat at the apostles' feet and they were taught. I'm sorry, I don't have an apostle for you here, here at Cornerstone Family Church. I'm the best that you're going to get probably unless we have a guest speaker, which is almost always better than me. We come in and we hear the teaching of God's Word because unlike our devotional life, the Bible talks about how we still need um, teachers because those teachers somehow are going to be a pipeline from God, not know-it-alls, not seeing at all, but God giving them specific things that will be channeled into the people that the people go, oh yeah, I never saw it that way before. And literally what teachers are supposed to be doing is teaching you how to see the Word of God. My job is not to explain the Word of God to you. My job is to teach you how to see, 
how to see, that you start seeing so much that you get so excited about it that now you are looking for things yourself. You're looking. You're looking for things. It's a, it's a place where we come in and we, we hang out together and we, there's just fun banter. And sometimes it's serious conversation, sometimes it's fun conversation, it's fellowshipping together, and it's the place where most Christians will testify they are greatly encouraged in ways that never happens any place else through the week. I talked to several people the last few weeks that have not been able to be here, health reasons, they just, uh, just, they, they're just really not hardly going out anywhere, I understand, I get that, go for it. But they have been telling me, you know, I've been watching online, I've been keeping up with everything, and they'll keep saying, but Pastor Scott, it's just not the same. It's like, I know. If it's all you've got, it's better than nothing. Please stay plugged into live stream, to virtual church, church on the sofa. You're, we're all still church family. But every one of you all listening at home to my voice right now, you would all say the same thing. It's just not the same. Listening to worship online is not like being in worship, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. Even the teaching, there's an anointing that happens in, a, in an atmosphere, in a physical location that doesn't transfer the same way online through TVs and internet and stuff. It's better than nothing. It's good. We need it. But there's something about the fellowship, the fellowship. It's a place of encouragement. I was reading a, a, a report this week by church analysts, and they were talking about a study they did, how that people who attended church on a regular basis had less stress than Christians who did not come to church very often. Less stress. The church environment, the physical environment, is the place where you discover the gifts of the Holy Spirit in you, and it's also the place where those gifts are extracted from you. That won't happen just out there in the world. You can be a believer among believers, but discovering the gifts of God in you and extracting those gifts, that will probably only mostly happen in a, in a setting like this over time. Not a Sunday morning service, but all the things that we do together, those gifts are discovered and they're extracted. It's in this gathering that I told you this summer, in these, these gatherings, these fellowships that we call church, it's still where 99% of all evangelism is taking place in America. It's where almost all inner healings and physical healings and marital healings, healings of all sorts, that stuff is almost exclusively still taking place in the gatherings. Maybe it shouldn't be that way, but it is that way. It was that way in the first century. And that has not changed. And even though we should all be going out and, and doing our ministry thing, there's always going to be a powerful anointing in the corporate gathering that's going to be different than anywhere else. It's a place that sometimes we don't think about it in the big picture unless you're the pastor and you're keeping a historical record of it in your head and your heart. It's the place of divine encounters, divine hookups, divine relationships. It's the place where we find our best friends. It's the place we find that husband we were waiting for, that wife we were looking for. How many people at Cornerstone Family Church and many that have moved away you found your family here. You met that person. You fell in love. You got married. You're having children. You're raising your children here in the same place where you met and fell in love. I can't even keep count of the numbers anymore. The people that have found divine friendships. Not just at Cornerstone, in thousands of places like Cornerstone. The fellowship, the gathering. So Jesus is 12 years old, and he, he says, why were you looking for me in other places? Did you not know this is where I would be? 
Look, God's everywhere. We know that. He's everywhere all the time. But you and I both would agree this morning, I'm sure, that when you are dry and you are urgently needing God and you're searching for something, you and I both know it's always easier to find it when you come to church. You're struggling out there. It's like, I got to get to church, man. I'm just, I'm struggling here, man. I got to hear a word today. I need a touch today. What do we do? It's, I got to get to church. Yeah, I get it. So he says, at 12 years old, didn't you know I had to be here? I had to be here. Our first fruits, our pattern said, did you not know I had to be in my father's house? Then we jump ahead to 30 years old, and we look at Luke 4. He has just come out of the temptation of the wilderness there, and he's being taunted. And the Bible talks about how he comes out in power, and now his ministry is going to instantly be launched. He's full of authority. He's full of power. He's equipped. He's ready to go. Let's see where we find this Jesus now. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread to them. And he taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Where did he return to? The same place we found him at 12 years old. He said, I've got to get back to that place where people are gathering. The fellowship. It wasn't the church yet. It didn't exist. He hadn't died. But Jesus was teaching. And he was on the scene launching, pre-launching the church. He comes out in power. He doesn't come out saying, well, I've got it all now. I'm full of the Spirit. I understand what God's doing. I just defeated the devil and on, on four corners. I don't need anything anymore. Where did we find him instantly? He's at church. He's in the fellowship. He's in the gathering. He's in the synagogues. And he's hanging out with other people. Today, Father, I'll be the first to admit to you, Lord, I'm an American Christian. And sometimes we think that we see so much, and in fact, we're blind, and we become the blind leading the blind. And we think that we become spiritually um, elevated above certain concepts that we think that was for an old school. That's, for, that's, that's legalism. That's for people to understand. Lord, forgive us for ever acting like attending church was legalism. That was our ignorance. We understand that going to church does not make us the church because as far as you're concerned, there's no such thing as the concept of going to church. But Lord, we do understand that if we are the church, we gather. We are the fellowship. And that you have plans to do things in us when we corporately gather. You say things corporately, Lord, that we seemingly can't hear any other time. You stir us, you move us, you convict us. You force us to respond to things that, Lord, if we're just out there by ourselves, we're not even going to think about it. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to face it. In fact, if it rises up, we're going to run the other direction. But, Lord, when you bring us in the gathering, the fellowship, we are in a captured audience. And you speak to us. And you make us see things we don't want to see. And you help us hear things we could not hear. You introduce us to people that is a very significant part of our future that we did not even know we needed to know. Now, Lord, this would seem like a weird time for me to talk about this because two-thirds of the American church is on the sofa this morning, not in the sanctuary. Lord, I don't preach this sermon to spank anybody because, Lord, church, the fellowship on the sofa is still the fellowship. It's still the gathering. In spirit, it's still the gathering. But Lord, we're asking, we're joining with the body of Christ all over this nation, all over the world, and we are saying, Lord, would you commandeer this virus? Would you wrangle this thing in, Lord, in a way where man doesn't get the glory, but you get the glory, and that the doors get reopened to the fellowship, the gathering of God's people? Now, I don't know in the big picture what you're doing. Maybe this serves your purpose better. I don't know. Maybe this, is a, maybe this is, really is a threshing floor. Maybe this is a way, Lord, where, where, where you're helping people see where they're, 
where they're really at spiritually. I know you're doing some stuff, but Lord, we're just telling you we long to be together. Lord, I know I'm speaking for hundreds of people listening on live stream right now when they would say, we long to be back together again. Some of them can't safely do that, Lord. Lord, we long to be together again at Cornerstone Family Church. We miss each other. We're better together than apart. We're more powerful together than apart. Lord, it's time to launch ministry out of this house like we've never seen before. I suspect, Lord, that despite what people think that they saw in 2020, 2021 is going to end up being one of the most significant years in human history. And I believe those who are not plugged in to the fellowship are going to miss it. Somehow, Lord, get us back together. Y'all agree with that? All y'all at home just hit a little, we need, a, we need an amen icon so these people don't have to actually type it out, right? Just a little, a little emoji, a little amen emoji. I love you guys. Um, this year... I'm telling you, I'm telling you, no soup for you. If you're not a Seinfeld person, I know you're sitting there going, what the moon is he talking about? I'm sorry, if you're not watching Seinfeld, you're going to miss half my sermon illustrations. <laughs> no soup for you. No more Esau soup. We've never really been a soup church anyway. But we are going to plow into the word of God. Do not let yourself be bored because there may not be a whole lot of life maintenance ministry happening here. We're going to take you to a place where you're not going to be needing that life maintenance ministry so much anymore. That's better, right? Preventative maintenance. And I want you to get excited. I agree with my wife. Get you a notebook, man. When it, whether it's here, whether it's at home in your studies, I promise you, Test me on this. You get a notebook and a pen out and start your devotional, that's a sign to God. They're willing to write it down. If you're willing to write it down, I've learned God's willing to say it. But if God's saying it and you're not willing to write it down, are you sure God was saying it? What does it say if we say God just spoke something to me and I'm not even willing to write it down so I can remember it? Learn to get you a notebook out and journal this stuff, man. Date it. Go back where you can read it. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there is a adventure, a fun adventure out there in the Word of God that most Christians have never entered into. We're going to show you how to do that. you got to come along for the ride, though, okay? Am I going to see a lot of notebooks in this place next week? You're going to, you're going to doodle in them, or you're going, to, you're going to write down spiritual stuff? All right, spiritual stuff. All right, I love you guys. Hey, those of you at home, I love you guys. Bless you all. Go in peace.